Welcome to the first part of the first lecture on this course on computational fluid dynamics. The aim of this lecture is to introduce the concept of numerical modelling for engineering design. Now engineering design is something that you will already be familiar with and of course engineering design predates computer modelling by a very very long time. So one of the things I want to articulate in this part of this lecture is not to forget the design tools we already know. They can complement very strongly the tools that computer modelling can offer. Now, traditional engineering design usually has a component of experimentation and modelling goes hand in hand with experimentation because a model that hasn't been experimentally validated simply cannot be trusted. The theme of validation is something that will feature regularly on this course because quite simply it's something I never want you to forget about. Sometimes, of course, experimentation isn't possible. Then, in those circumstances, validation can be carried out against maybe literature data, so long as there is sufficient data in the literature with which to validate. Now, we're going to start by examining this phrase, numerical modelling, as a tool for engineering design. And we're going to discuss exactly what we mean by each of these terms. And we'll see that actually we need to understand exactly what that phrase says in order to get the best out of what we're going to do. So here we go. Numerical modelling for engineering design. Let's consider the numerical modelling component. Now, numerical modelling means that we're going beyond simple hand calculations, simple analytical calculations. We're using computer-aided analysis. We might be using a pre-built computational fluid dynamics code, as you will be, for example, on this course. Or you may also be writing your own codes. This is something we're not covering on this course, but the concepts of validation are even more important for those. Now, in any numerical model, as with any analytical model, there are going to be inherent assumptions and approximations. And we need to understand the effect of those assumptions and those approximations on the results that the model gives us. Your engineering model is not a perfect facsimile of real-world reality. It is a facsimile, i.e. there are assumptions and approximations, and it's very important to understand exactly what those are. Numerical analysis is a very, very powerful technique. It means that you can adapt your equation sets, for example, a Navier-Stokes equations or other transport equations such as heat transport or mass transport, to complex geometry. Again, something that isn't necessarily obtainable with analytical techniques. Let's think about the second part, because we're using numerical modelling for engineering. Now, engineers have to deliver safe, pragmatic solutions. These models actually pertain to something that's going to happen in the real world. They're not just a theoretical construct or some means of understanding a nice piece of scientific data. They have to offer safe, pragmatic solutions. Moreover, these solutions have to be timely, they have to be functional, i.e. they have to work, and they also have to be cost-effective, because if they're not cost-effective, they just simply won't be put into reality. And so, when we think about numerical modelling in the context of engineering, it narrows down somewhat what we're trying to achieve and really focuses the mind. Now let's think of this last term, because we're using numerical modelling for engineering design. So design is all about using toolkits and methodologies that have to deliver something physically realistic. They have to be reliable, they have to be robust, they have to be reproducible, and they have to be trusted, because when a design is first made, it will then be reviewed, and if the calculations or the models in that design can't be reproduced at that review stage, then there is no trust in the design, which means that it's dead in the water. Now, a successful numerical model for engineering design will allow rapid design optimization to take place. Now, this is incredibly important for modern engineering and is a very, very powerful tool that computational techniques can offer. But there is a huge caveat, only if the model is trusted and validated. And so again, we're coming back to this concept of validation that will crop up many times throughout this course. So on the board in front of you, I'm going to put a flow chart of what I'm going to call traditional engineering design. And 
engineering design typically starts with the identification of a need or a problem. Once that need or problem has been identified, engineers then get together, usually in a team, to figure out how to efficiently simplify the problem such that you can apply your engineering knowledge to solve it. And that engineering knowledge might be some kind of analysis, it might be hand calculations, it might be approximate methods, it might be quite in-depth calculations. But the end goal of this engineering analysis is to draw up a design for a prototype of some sort. So, once that prototype has been designed, it needs to be manufactured, which is in itself not a trivial task. Never underestimate the complexity involved in prototype manufacture. And then it has to be tested for whatever its function is going to be. Again, this is not a trivial step and can be a very time consuming, very skillful process. So once these tests have taken place, the first thing you'll probably find is that your prototype doesn't quite work as you intend it to. And so it's going to be modified and fiddled about with a little bit until it works, whatever work is in the context of the tests you are doing. Then you can gather data and examine its performance. Now, when you examine its performance, you might decide that actually the prototype needs altering. More alteration than is required just to make it work. Significant design alteration. And so we end up in a bit of an iterative process. Again, it'll go back to the design stage. There'll be modifications to the design made. And there'll probably be another prototype made, another prototype tested, and another set of experiments then considered. So, very often, one can go around this cycle of design, prototype manufacture, prototype test, updated design quite a few times. And it's not unusual to have to call in some experts who can give further information as to how to make your prototype work in the way you intended it to. Ultimately, however, you will achieve something that works and everybody will be very happy. And using the data that you've got from the prototype testing, you'll be able to draw up your major design and make it to the specification that the general market or the outside world actually needs. At that point, the uh, manufacturing stage for your object will be completed. So, traditional engineering design can take a long time. Um, any design process is going to be somewhat iterative and it has to be that way in order for the object or item that you're designing to actually work in this safe manner and cost-effective manner. So, the prototype manufacturer can be expensive and time-consuming. Ideally, we would like to decrease the cost and decrease the time component of that step of the process. The whole concept of the prototype not working first time also adds to the time-consuming nature of the design process and also to the expense of the design process. The more accurately we can make a prototype, the less time consuming and less costly the process is going to be. So what we need to do is to have a method to make an accurate design in the first instance. Now, in traditional terms, that means involving experienced engineers with a lot of insight, and that is still very relevant in today's world. However, what we find is that we're able to shortcut a lot of the steps in this process by sufficiently validated computational models. So, let's think about how computers and computer-aided techniques can enhance the design process. The first step is the same. There's going to be a need or a problem that requires a solution. Then there's going to be a team chat on how one figures out the approach to the problem you're trying to solve. Then, as before, you're going to apply engineering knowledge and engineering analysis, and you're going to draw up a design for a prototype. These three steps are exactly the same as the traditional design process. Now, here's where things diverge a little bit. What these days we can do is to get that prototype design and model it in software, in silico. And then we can have a look at how that design actually works. So those models will generate some data and we can iterate those models until the data it generates gives us something that appears to work as required. Then we can go and build a prototype from that design. And we can go and test that prototype in the hope that it will give us a more accurate starting point to the experimentation process. 
Now, here on the whiteboard is one of the most critical steps in this entire scheme. Validation of the model against experimental data from the prototype. If the prototype is doing something that your model isn't doing, then there's a mismatch. and We don't sufficiently understand our design. And so, it's not unusual at this point to go, model isn't fit for purpose. OK, let's go and reassess the assumptions in the model, reassess the way it's solved, and see if we can narrow the gap between our model of reality and actually what reality is. And so at that point, again, we may need expert input to help us. And so there'll be a loop here that you'll go around looking at your model results, looking at your experimental results and going, OK, we can get these to match now. Then we ask the question, does the prototype need alteration? Is the prototype doing what the design requires it to do? And if not, at this point, we can go back to our now validated model and go and optimise our prototype such that it does perform in the way that we want to do. However, this step is completely nonsensical if we don't trust our model. And again, this all hinges on successful validation, successful match between the prediction of the computer and the results from experimentation. So once we're happy that we've got a successfully validated model, we can draw up our final design for the manufacturer and we can give those specifications to a fabricator. And ultimately, we end up with our manufacturer of our prototype, but we also end up with a validated model that we can use for further research and development work, which is a very, very powerful tool to have at your disposal. So computer-aided en engineering design takes the best of the components from the traditional design process, the skill, the analysis of the engineer, but combines it with a very powerful tool, that of computational techniques, such that we can very quickly draft up a design and test it in the computational world. However, these tests and these models are nonsensical if we haven't validated. Validation, validation, validation is going to be the watchword that you will be muttering throughout this course. So, computer-aided engineering design should produce a prototype that's a closer reflection on what's required because we can do some optimization and some parametric studies prior to prototype manufacture. Getting the prototype made, again, can be expensive and time-consuming, but hopefully, now, we only have to make it once, rather than iterate that physical process a number of times. We need, of course, to compare what the model is doing to what the experimental data suggests that reality is doing, and we need that to match. We need that to match sufficiently well for our purposes, and we need to have confidence in our model. Once we've got confidence in our model, we can do all sorts of things like optimization and design alterations, insight into failure modes, and maybe trust the results. Now, if we do that without a validated model, what we get is some parallel universe of the computer predicting something that just doesn't happen in physical reality. And of course, this is very destructive because don't forget this is for engineering design. If you've got a tool that doesn't work and can't be trusted, people lose faith in it and it just simply won't be used anymore. Engineers, by nature, very rightly, are cynical and sceptical because the cost of things going wrong is just too great. And so sometimes in industry, you will hear computational fluid dynamics by its acronym CFD but also in a very tongue-in-cheek way, some more senior and cynical engineers will also use the same acronym, CFD, as perhaps an acronym for Colours for Directors, indicating that the nice pretty pictures that CFD has as its output are no more use than just to show to somebody with some purse strings. When things have gone particularly wrong, there's another acronym for CFD, which is a complete flipping disaster. So be aware of validation. With sufficient validation, these two acronyms, Colours for Directors and Complete Disaster, won't apply. Now, of course, we were talking about numerical modelling as a tool for engineering design. This is not just restricted to computational fluid dynamics. There's all sorts of numerical models that the engineer can use. Within the realm of computational fluid dynamics, it's very common nowadays to hear about multi-physics simulation. And multi-physics simulation really does what it says on the tin. 
the modern computational packages are capable of solving more than just a Navier-Stokes equations. You can couple in additional problems to that. For example, you can couple in transport equations for heat transport, mass transport, phase transport, and examine all kinds of complex physics where you've got more than one physical system going on at the same time. For example, buoyancy-driven flow, when you get heated air rising through, for example, a heat sink. This is a coupling of heat transfer and fluid dynamics and thermodynamics. And so these examples can give very, very detailed insight into phenomena. Again, with the caveat that we've said a number of times now, so long as sufficient validation work has been completed. The thing never to forget when it comes to using multi-physics packages is that with additional complexity comes additional difficulty. And the more opportunities exist for unphysical result prediction. So more care is required and more in-depth validation is again required. We're coming back to our mantra of validation, validation, validation. So let's summarise this part of this lecture with a few key points. Numerical modelling can be a very, very powerful and genuinely useful engineering tool if and only if it's used correctly. By correctly, I mean that models should be validated against something obtained from the real world, either your own experimental data or experimental data in the literature that has already been published by trusted scientific journals. Models that are not validated can be very, very detrimental to the discipline as it's very easy to get them wrong at great expense financially and great expense of time. 